humbled and honored to be here before all of you. I'm just like you. I'm a daughter, a sister, a mother, like so many of you. And I was blessed, I am blessed, to have had five very beautiful children and a career as a family nurse practitioner. But I'm here today to bear witness to the light of Christ amid the dark captivity and horrific execution of our son, Jim, in August of 2014. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I'm here to testify to the reality of the light of Christ in my life. To me, that light is the hope, faith, and love of Christ within each one of us. A candle helps is an important image to me because I view the light of Christ as that valiant, fragile flame that burns brightly within us, even if we don't notice it. I was born in New Hampshire, grew up there, and was blessed with a faith in God from my earliest years. Both my parents were Christian, my dad a Unitarian, my mom Roman Catholic. My father did not want me baptized until I was of an age to choose which religion I wanted to follow. Now my lack of baptism really bothered my mother, but it actually made me very interested in God. My mother's deep faith intrigued me. Generally, my younger sister Rita went to Unitarian services with dad while I joined my mom at mass. I was drawn to God and his profound stillness, and particularly drawn to his mother Mary. After school, I remember stopping by our church to pray in front of a statue of the Blessed Virgin. I was really unsure what drew me, but I knew I felt safe and loved. I chose to become a Roman Catholic at the age of 14 and received the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist all in one day. <laughs> Two years later, my dad died of cancer. His death spurred me to study nursing and continued to, continue to draw me to God. I, after high school, I went to the University of New Hampshire, and I was blessed there by the presence of our beloved um, chaplain, of Father Vincent Lawless, who had a deformed hand. I was told that he was nearly denied ordination due to his deformity. But once ordained, he truly gave glory to God. I was fed spiritually by his sermons and evening folk masses throughout my college years. I seriously started to consider religious life, the Peace Corps, all sorts of things, but I lacked the courage or the encouragement. And at the same time, I met my husband, John, and grew in relationship with him. John pursued me, and we spent more and more time together studying, going to Mass, just conversing for hours and dreaming together. Father Vincent Lawless married us in August of 1971. He died less than a year later in front of the altar at church. But I'll never forget him. His deep faith and goodness fanned that tiny flame of faith I had within me. After our wedding, John and I could not afford a honeymoon, so we put our wedding gifts in a U-Haul attached to our secondhand red comet and headed west to West Des Moines. My first job in Iowa was as a community health nurse. I remember doing maternity and newborn counseling to unwed teenage mothers when I knew nothing of motherhood myself. At the time, I really had no idea what a life-altering blessing motherhood would be for me. All I knew was I hoped we could have a baby. 
I did go to weekly mass, but did nothing else particular to pursue my faith. But God pursued me. Our son, Jim, was the oldest of our five children. And except for the first year of colic-induced sleepless nights that many of us have endured, Jim was such a joy. He was a happy child, curious about the world and people. He loved to be read to. He loved Bible stories, history, and fantasy. He had quite an imagination, loving to pretend to be all the heroes I read to him about. We lived in Texas um, during his preschool years, and I can still see him in our backyard with his coonskin cap pretending to be Davy Crockett at the Alamo. He and his closest brother, Michael, had so many adventures together. One distinctive thing about Jim was his big heart and ready smile for everyone. As a little boy, he had a kindness about him, which, you know, I, I really took for granted. He was easygoing, made friends very easily. Jim grew up in the Catholic Church, serving as an altar boy, but he wasn't particularly religious. Perhaps he was a lot like your sons and daughters. He was fun-loving, hard-working, and well-liked. And like many teens, he gave us quite a few gray hairs. He loved to explore, was very curious about people and other cultures. In 1978, I was drawn to go on a Crucio weekend retreat. Crucio is a weekend course in Christianity which originated in um, Spain, but is now worldwide. Crucio was such a moving experience of God's closeness. I became hungrier to know God. That weekend helped me to feel God's unconditional love for me. I remember being drawn to more frequent Mass and the reading of Scripture. Mass became a place of refuge and sacred stillness where my mind and soul was truly fed with the Word of God and the Eucharist. It was a safe place where God nurtured me and further fanned that light of Christ within me. I rather enjoyed moving around the country as my husband went to medical school, internship, and then joined the Army Medical Corps. I enjoyed the diverse and interesting people I met and grew in faith. But my husband wanted to come back to New Hampshire to a tiny lakeside community of Wolfboro after his years in the Army. I went along with the plan, but inside I really resisted. I didn't want to go to such a remote place. It didn't even have a movie theater. And though doubtful, I remember asking God to help me find him even there. Well, God answered my prayers in abundance. At that point, we had three young sons, and I wanted them to know about God in their lives. So I was challenged to attempt to prepare our parish children for a First Holy Communion. I know I learned so much more than they did. I just began to realize how God yearns to feed us, to care for us, how he continually offers his strength and hope for our journey. At that time, in our small state of New Hampshire, we had a powerful office of renewal, led by a very charismatic priest. Father Mark became a dear friend to me, becoming my spiritual director for years and godfather to our fifth child and only daughter, Katie. I had the privilege of serving on a Crisio team and being fed by an informal weekly prayer group the devout women in my prayer group taught me so patiently and lovingly about God's goodness and compassion, week after week, as we reflected on the upcoming Sunday readings together. Those 13 years spent in Wolfboro were truly filled with God, nurturing me and strengthening me for the future. 
While I thoroughly enjoyed being a mother and growing in my faith, my husband John was working nonstop. He was the only internal medicine physician in this tiny town that mushroomed to a summer population of over 35,000 people. While I enjoyed taking our kids to the lake for picnics and swimming, John was working day and night. And we started to grow apart. Marriage Encounter, a weekend retreat for marriages, allowed a, beef, a brief respite. But gradually, we withdrew more and more into our separate lives. John was working all the time, and I was busy with our five children. In 1993, John suddenly announced he wanted to move south to a bigger city, a medical center. And I was left in Wolfboro to care for our home and family while he began commute, commuting south to work. John became very angry with me on the rare times he was home, and I really didn't know what was going on inside of him. We went to marriage, and count, marriage um, counseling rather to no avail. Our marriage was disintegrating, and I was clueless. I couldn't figure out why. We finally went on a retrovi weekend, a Catholic weekend for troubled marriages for surely ours was becoming troubled. We actually went twice. Retrovi, with its deep, with its daily communication and weekly follow-up sessions, gradually and miraculously began to heal our marriage. Such an unexpected time of healing our dialogues became. The rosary had also become my constant companion when I was lonely, anxious, or afraid. It accompanied me on walks or drives. It just helped me to relax and trust in the Lord. I learned the Divine Mercy Chaplet on a pilgrimage um, to Mejigoria in 1994. The more I prayed the rosary and the Divine Mercy Chaplet, the more I felt God's hope and his light. I began to feel a visceral strengthening within me, just a deeper and deeper assurance that God was with me. Thus, our merciful God was preparing me, day by day and step by step, to ever so, ever so gently inviting me to come closer, sit for a while, be refreshed. Many days as a young mother of five, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 spoke to me. Jesus would say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And when bigger problems developed, the 23rd Psalm assured me that God was with me, leading me beside quiet waters, refreshing my soul, and guiding me along the right paths for his name's sake. Little did I know how much I would need him in my darkest valley. That dark valley began in Lent of 2011, when our oldest son Jim was kidnapped while working as an independent conflict journalist in Libya. We were in shock. We immediately fled to our Adoration Chapel to pray. The somber, somber tone of the Lenten scriptures embraced me and strengthened my awareness of a deep connection through prayer to Jim, even though he was thousands of miles away in Tripoli. I spent hours and hours in prayer um, before candles often, symbolizing my hope in Christ, and that made me feel very close to Jim. His Libyan captivity only lasted 44 days, but at that time we were plunged into deep panic and fear for Jim's life. Our church community rallied around us. I remember the huge way that their prayer and that of so many others lifted our spirits and gave us hope. I remember when one of my dear friends, Sister Mary Rose, telling me that she had heard the Lord tell her that Jim would return home when he was freed interiorly. 
What an incredible joy and deep gratitude we felt at that homecoming in May of 2011. Jim returned home with a much deeper faith. He had prayed the rosary throughout his captivity and had been given scripture verses by another Christian prisoner passed through cracks in an adjoining cell. He told us how close to us he had felt through prayer. What a deep confirmation of the power of prayer and God's mercy. But Jim also returned with a deeper resolve to continue his work of giving voice to the voiceless. When I tried to urge him not to go back to the conflict zone, he would say, Mom, I have found my passion. I like to think that some of the seeds of faith were planted in his childhood, but his faith and sense of social justice was surely strengthened at Marquette University, the Jesuit college he chose to attend. At Marquette, he was challenged to make a difference, to be a man for others. Jim had, li had lived a very middle-class life, and it was really at Marquette that he was first exposed to real poverty in the inner city schools of Milwaukee, where he was encouraged to tutor. Then after graduation, he taught in the inner city of Phoenix, um, Arizona, through Teach for America. Little did I know, but while he was in graduate school, he taught English to unwed mothers in Holyoke, Mass., and later when in Chicago, he cooked, he cooked, he taught rather at the Cook County boot camp. He seemed drawn to serve. Jim was a voracious reader and an interested writer, so it really wasn't surprising that he chose to become a journalist. He'd always been a good listener. He was always interested in everyone's story. So we were initially very encouraged that he found a career that combined his interest in people with capturing their stories. He had been working in Syria since March of 2012 when he was captured again on Thanksgiving Day. He vanished. We did not know whether he was dead or alive for the next 10 months. From the beginning, this kidnapping was totally different. There was no trace of Jim, and we never heard his voice again. My personal way of the cross had begun. My innocent, good-hearted Jim, taken at gunpoint, sold and held captive for being a journalist. We were incredulous that he'd been captured again. We were terrified at his disappearance. No one knew who had captured him or where he was. We were grateful when FBI came to visit and a media outlet funded, funded a security team, but the months went by with no sign of Jim. So I finally felt I needed to quit my job as a nurse practitioner and try my best to help. So I began a series of many trips to Washington, D.C., to the State Department, to the FBI, to ambassadors, also to New York, to the UN, just begging for help, anyone who would listen. And I, I was repeatedly told that Jim was their highest priority. You know, I kind of felt like the persistent widow in Luke 18, one to eight, reminding FBI, state officials, ambassadors that Jim was still missing. My trips made me feel useful and prayer kept me hopeful. But by September of 2013, Jim had still not been found. But as a mom, I had a certainty that he was alive, and I kept praying that he would be strengthened by God through our persistent prayers. I, re I recall the words of, a, of the hymn, Be Not Afraid, which was sung at church throughout Jim's childhood. I was just hoping he would remember that God was with him amid this trial. A um, lot more candles and prayers. 
by September, by that September, I was invited to do the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. It was odd because I had first heard about those exercises many years before when Jim was a toddler in Chicago. I remember bringing little Jim to a meeting with the priest about the exercises and him telling me it was not the right time. Now, 39 years later, it was the perfect time. The weekly St. Ignatius prayer experience and the spiritual direction truly sustained me during that time. Those exercises encouraged me to learn to sit quietly. Again, the lit candle reminded me of God's continual presence challenging me to listen and be still with God. Finally, in October of 2013, two former ISIS prisoners called to let us know that Jim was alive. He was alive in an Aleppo prison. They told us exactly where he was. Oh, how that news gave us hope. And then, at the end of November, we received our first email from Jim's captors. His perfect answers to the three proof-of-life questions that only he could have answered convinced us that these captors had and were holding our beloved Jim. They demanded 100,000 euros, or all pri Muslim prisoners, in exchange for him which of course was impossible for us, but at least we had found him. Jim was alive. The released hostages tell us that the deep joy that those proof of life questions gave Jim, he knew we had found him. But then 30 days later, the emails abruptly stopped. It was odd because that December, our youngest and only daughter, Katie, became engaged. She would not set a date for her wedding because she wanted to wait for Jim's return. So on one hand, I was desperately trying to find help to free Jim, and then on the other, helping our little girl plan her wedding. Tara on one side and Joy on the other. I was lifted up by the love and understanding of our Katie. Her joy gave me relief and hope. She was one of many angels God sent me. As the European hostages, I should say that Jim was, we found out later, Jim was held with 18 other hostages. And as the European hostages were gradually released in 2014, they each reached out to us to reassure us that Jim was alive and he was strong. I had a chance to go to Spain to meet two of the hostages who had returned and to Paris to consult at the French Hostage Crisis Center. All of my desperate attempts to find help for Jim. These hostages tell us um, what a source of hope Jim had been for them always encouraging them that they were not forgotten. They told us stories of them giving lectures to each other to pass the time, even making a risk game out of an old cardboard and date and olive seeds and trying to exercise together. I thank God for putting him in the midst of such good men. Their phone calls and kindness lightened our cross a bit, and gave us hope that Jim, too, might be released. They also spoke about Jim's devotion to prayer, using the five Muslim calls to prayer as his routine, and how it helped him to remain hopeful. You know, I found a mass app when I was traveling. Um, I've, I've drew strength from being able to find a church wherever I was and go and pray and attend Mass. What a solace that was. Because so often when I was traveling, I was alone, and it was such a solace to know that I really wasn't. 
I also use the ba daily Bible readings, kept me very hopeful. By May of 2014, we found out that Jim was being held with three other Americans. So we came together in Washington to meet each other and to ask the government for help. I hadn't gotten anywhere alone, so we thought, we'll come together. We finally got into the White House, and we really thought we were heard. And all too late in June of 2014, we realized we were on our own to get Jim out. So we sought legal advice and started to raise pledges for the ransom demand. Also in June, the last European hostage was released. Daniel was a 25-year-old Danish photographer who had spent the last year of captivity with Jim's last year um, in captivity with him. And he kindly memorized a letter from Jim to all of us. Those were his la Jim's last words to us. Jim spoke about how kind and generous Jim had been to him throughout his captivity and how he had consoled him. Daniel said, Jim was pure goodness, perhaps too good. Jim's letter through Daniel was such an answer to prayer, though, because I knew for sure that God was being so close to Jim. I knew he couldn't be that good without God. Uh, that summer, I went to Paris a second time to ask for advice for the then-released French hostages. I was so encouraged by their support and the leads I obtained in France and Denmark until my husband, John, called me to say that we had received an email, another email, from Jim's captives, captors threatening to kill him. But I was in denial and hopeful that at least the captors were in touch. I foolishly thought that if we offered the captors the money pledged by our generous friends, they would release Jim. I totally underestimated the hatred of Jim's captors. The witness of these returning Western hostages is portrayed very poignantly in the documentary Jim, the James Foley story. That was a film um, that one of Jim's friends insisted on doing. Um, it was through long conversations with the men who had shared Jim's last year on Earth that I came to understand a bit about how God had sustained Jim throughout the darkness of his imprisonment, torture, and starvation. I'm so grateful for those men who shared that time with him. When I returned home in mid-July, I was exhausted from travel and fear. I remember, I remember going to our Adoration Chapel and just falling on my knees and totally surrendering Jim to God. I did not want to give up my will for Jim to come home to us. I really didn't. I had resisted. But I finally knew it was time. I had to surrender him. I didn't know what else to do. I struggled to let Jim go, but I knew I had to entrust him to God. You know, I felt a lingering fear that God might have a different plan for Jim than I, but I also felt a strange peace that God would take care of him. I was reassured in prayer that God would, in fact, set him free. Well, two weeks later, Jim was brutally and publicly murdered for being an American journalist and a Christian. Though we had been warned, I was in shock, total disbelief. You know, as the reality sunk in, I felt a surge of anger. I was angry at ISIS, at our government, at all those who had refused their help. I felt such a horrible bitterness rising within me. I struggled to catch my breath to accept what had happened to Jim. Lord, this is not what I meant when I surrendered him, not at all. How could this be? I staggered under the weight of this loss. <clears throat> Sorry, I really didn't know if I could go on, but I remember praying so hard not to become bitter and praying 
for the grace to be forgiving and to be merciful. Well, that was when the legions of angels descended on us. First, our four beloved children and family flew home. Then friends and colleagues came laden with food and warm hugs. Flowers, plants, thousands of cards from all over the world poured in. Our post lady would leave us, leave us buckets of mail for the next year. We received a 50-pound hand-carved wooden cross from Texas, multiple hand-painted portraits of Jim, hundreds of mass cards and rosaries, so many beautiful children's drawings, books filled with hope. All this love helped me to feel God's presence again. And that same peace I had felt when I surrendered Jim returned. I knew then, I'm sorry, um, for sure that God had freed Jim in the only way possible. He could no longer be starved or tortured or beaten. He was truly free. You know, the Stations of the Cross have shown me how God in his goodness stoops to model for us how to endure our sufferings and walk in faith. Jesus was whipped and scourged, crowned with thorns, like our Jim, who was starved and tortured throughout his captivity. But also like us, when we feel throbbing pain of loss or illness. Jesus carries the heavy cross of our sinfulness, like each of us trying to shoulder what happens to us in life, like families suffering in refugee camps, starved and robbed of their homes or loved ones. Jesus meets his ever-faithful mother. Mary's example of trust in God has helped me because she continued to walk in faith even though she did, may not have understood, like me, why her son had to suffer in this way. But she trusted. She walked in faith, which is what I'm called to do. God sustained her and used her to model for all of us how to endure our days of dark suffering that touch all of us in some ways. Even Jesus, in his humanity, needed Simon's help in the fifth station. Like Jim needed our help, needed our prayer, like our suffering of brothers and sisters need all of us. The sixth and eighth station reveal the mercy of others witnessing Christ's suffering. Like Jim, experiencing the mercy of being held with such good men. Like us, when we're generous to those suffering around us. You know, the Lord even models failure for us, which most of us have experienced, by falling under the weight of the cross. Not once, but three times. Just like Jim when he was first kidnapped, or like me when all my efforts to help Jim failed. Like all of us, when we try really hard but still come up short, you know, when we feel tempted to give up, to despair. The image of the Lord following under the weight of our sins can also reveal the way we fail to love, have been selfish or arrogant. Then Jesus models the stripping away of his clothing, his dignity, his reputation like Jim when he was stripped away of everything and treated like an animal, like any of us when we're stripped of our family or health, a job or our home. And finally, Christ is crucified and dies for us. Like Jim, Jesus was finally freed from his ordeal by death. During these two years of Jim's captivity and murder, there have been moments of despair. But my faith in God's presence with Jim and in our midst has given me a deep, abiding hope. 
I believe Jesus submitted to all his earthly suffering to give us a powerful example of how to walk in faith and hope amid the worst of circumstances to assure us that he is powerfully present in a very personal way. If we but ask and notice, it continues to be a struggle for me to slow down long enough to pray, to quiet myself, to notice the beauty around me, as Sister Grace so beautifully mentioned. You know, the, just the glory of God around, the sunshine outside, the beauty of the people sitting with us at the table. All signs of God's abiding love in the midst of our lives. You know, we have a choice when we suffer. We can choose to grow bitter, or we can choose God's loving mercy to teach us how to forgive. Forgiveness is a process, but the choice is always ours. Do we continue the cycle of vengeance, violence, and hatred, or do we pray for the grace to resist bitterness and seek mercy and forgiveness? Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, 1 to 9, when he said, He came to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captive, and recovery of sight to the blind. Jim's life challenges me as an American to care about the hundreds of other Americans who are held captive around the world today and to care about the courageous journalists who bring us world news, and to want to inspire all of us to be people of moral courage and compassion. Jim would have wanted something positive to result from his death. I do not want Jim to have suffered and died in vain. And that is why we established the James Foley Legacy Foundation, to inspire moral courage one person at a time. I believe moral courage is the light of Christ within each of us. That light that lights our paths, that empowers us with compassion and commitment to others, and gives us to cur the courage to do what is loving and Christ-like in a world that often wants to do the opposite. Our Lord is counting on each of us to protect and nurture that love of Christ within ourselves, to make it vibrant in our families, in our community. Jesus lights the way. He's the lamp to our feet if we but dare to follow. He challenges me every day, and I'm sure he challenges each of you to fan that flame of faith and hope within each of us, and to carry his light into the world. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you.